That's God's plan. That's why I call this uh, learning to hear God speak, because the goal is to be in tune with God. Now, if you, when you look at the William Miller five-minute revival that I have, I have a thing on there called useful irritations. What I mean by that are things that happened that I had no clue, but I knew were wrong. Okay? Like, for instance, the first church I had out of seminary, um, two weeks before I arrived, my wife and I arrived to be the pastor, a, a lady decked a deacon in the foyer of the church and almost knocked him out. Now, you could talk to this lady and she could talk about God like you would not believe. And I'm a new, I came out of the Catholic Church. I went to uh, undergraduate. I interned my first year. I prayed, no funerals, Lord. I don't know where you get Adventist holy water. Because I came from the Catholics. I, I knew all the Catholic rituals. I had never been to an Adventist funeral. So I was, I prayed for that. So when I came out of seminary and this happened, I'm sitting there going, something's wrong. But I did not know what it was. So I made it my decision at that time, and this led me to do this with all of these useful irritations. When something comes and I say, I don't understand this, there's something amiss, or there, there's something here, but I need to know more. And sometimes it's positive, but I just don't know the biblical reason. So I started, and I, I started in Genesis. And... What I did is I studied and studied and used the old concordance, because this was back in the days before computers. I used the old concordance, and I finally found in 1 John, after almost a year, so I wished William Miller had started in Revelation and went backwards, but 1 John chapter 5, or is it chapter 4? Here's what it says. Verse 17 of chapter 4. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So if you're coming to the judgment and you have fear, you've got more work on love. Okay? That's what it says, because it says we shouldn't have any fear in the judgment of coming before God. Jesus loves us. Especially when you read John, the Gospel of John, it says that if you come to G Jesus in the Gospel of John, he says he's never lost anybody. And his father's stronger than him, and his father's not lost anybody. Isn't that cool? There are some great promises. And it, but it says, we love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen. That's the problem, folks. One of the signs for me for judgment is if you can't get along with the church brethren and sisters, then there's something amiss with your relationship with God. You cannot change what's going on with God and not have it change what you have going on with people. Yep. Yep. And so this is, these are the useful irritants, okay? Another one that I had was a guy who came to my church and told people that we should be calling God Yahweh. And, we should, and I said, well, God has many names. And he says, no, God has many attributes, but his name is Yahweh. And if we all did this, Jesus could come. So broke out the concordance and started studying from Genesis on. And I looked up the word name, and I finally got to Deuteronomy, and it says, My name is Jealousy, for I am a jealous God. And he goes, well, that's only one text. I said, yes, but it's a text that messes up your theory. You have to adjust your theory. See, that's part of this. Whenever there's this cognitive dissonance between text and between what's going on, we have to, to work on that, okay? So there's another thing that I want you to take a, a look at Matthew 23 verses 26 and following Matthew chapter 23 
verses 26 uh, to 35. You could even start in 25. Um, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside may be clean also. Now this is the part. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypo hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build up the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, your witness is against yourself that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Now, I want you to get the picture here of what Jesus is talking about. These people were taking care of the prophets' tombs that their fathers had killed. And they had the right answer for the day their fathers lived in. But what were they planning to do with Jesus? They were planning to kill Jesus. One of my reasons for using this methodology for studying anything out is because I want to have the right answer, not for 1888. How many of you know what we should have done in 1888? Should we have gone for righteousness by faith in 1888? Yes. But what should we be doing in 2019? Any idea? Do you understand? As we talk about this, we want to study things out so we're right for the day we live in. Is Jesus coming soon? Yes. The 144,000 is a group that Jesus is going to have when he comes back. Now, when you study the 144,000 as I laid out last time I was here and I have on that sheet, Guess who you can talk to and have a, a really nice conversation with? Any Jehovah Witness that comes to your door. Now the difference in the Jehovah Witness, now I'm doing apologetics here now. The difference in, in Jehovah Witness view of the 144,000 is they believe it's a literal number. In Revelation, there is a literary sis, um, system where John hears something and then he turns and looks. It's the same number. So back earlier where it lists the 12,000 of each of the tribes and it says then I turned and looked and saw a number that could a group that couldn't be numbered those are the same group so the Jehovah Witnesses issue is they believe the 144,000 is literal and the only way you can get to heaven is if you become the slave of one of those literal 144,000 so in Kansas Nebraska conference there would be Jehovah Witnesses who left the Jehovah Witness church and they would have no longer a slave on their bumper stickers. And I didn't understand that until I found out that this is what they were teaching about the 144,000. So there is no limit on the 144,000, a group without number. But in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, it has three things. So pure doctrine, you follow Jesus wherever he goes, and the third thing is you stop using guile, you stop using deceit. Now that's not easy in this world. Okay? But everybody can be, there is never anybody between us and Jesus. That's the first thing I hear. If somebody's between you and Jesus, I say something's wrong. There is no person that should be between you and Jesus. Okay? So just, just notice we go through this. Here are people that Jesus is talking about who have the right answer for their Father's day, but the wrong answer for their current day. So I'm trying to help people hear God's voice on any topic, if you start in Genesis and follow it through, you will be able to be relatively assured that if you study together, there will be people who notice things you might miss. So I like this for studying with groups. Because the goal is not what is Ken like. What is Ken doing? The goal is what does God want? And if we don't get to the point where we think of where does God want, and one of the things that really shook me up recently, um, one of my friends posted that a recent study of pastors in North America, not Adventists, all pastors, says that over a 
third of pastors in North America would be considered narcissist by the psychological definition when they take the test. They did, that's what the study was showing. There are a lot of people who are not following God, and it's all about them. So if we're going to follow God, we have to hear his voice. And, we, and this study method has been how I've been able to fight my way through all those things where I'm not sure. And there are times, I will tell you, that somebody will tell me something, I'll say, that doesn't sound right but I have no biblical reason. And that's when I go to the Bible and I study it out. And if some people come to your church and they have something, study it out with them. Get the whole group together, but what's the process? Number one, we start in Genesis, find anything on that topic and follow it all the way through. And you're going to get rid of the biases of just manipulating text in the order that people can do the text, right? And that's why we're doing this. This is a process that's about how to hear God's voice. And it starts back with Jesus, right? How did he teach? He went to Moses and then the prophets. And Moses is the beginning books of the Bible and the prophets. I call it William Miller's Bible study method. He found Jesus accidentally. But this is what made Adventist Adventist. And I want to get us back to that process so that when we study it, we can say, yeah, I know this is true. And we can study any controversial topic that you need to study. For instance, today, what would be topics that are controversial within the church? Jewelry? Ordination of women? Last generation theology? Is that correct? That they're, what they're teaching about the last generation? Or is there something amiss? Well, we can go to the Bible and follow it all the way through, and we can answer any questions if we desire. Whether we do it in our own devotional time, or we gather together and say, we're going to study this out, take some topic. For instance, let me give you another one. Um, Desmond Ford said that the Hebrews 9 in particular was about the Day of Atonement, and that Jesus went straight to heaven into the most holy place. It took me about five years to figure out what what was wrong. Let's go to Hebrews 9. This is one of those that I'm just going to do, and then we'll get back to our topic of the state of the dead. Hebrews chapter 9. And here was the logic at that time. I didn't have it while he was... You know, basically, he had been pushed to the side of the church a little bit, but he was never taken out of the church for his belief. Um, Verse 11 of Hebrews 9 was, But Christ came as a high priest of good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, not as this creation, but not with the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from the dead? Now, what, what um, day do, blood, do we use uh, in the sanctuary the blood of goats? Yeah, Day of Atonement. Except we uh, have a different day that was completely missed by most of us when we talk about the sanctuary. And that is the inauguration service. Uses the same exact sacrifices. And how do we know this is going to be the um, inauguration and not the Day of Atonement? Yes, the opening ceremony for the, any of the sanctuary. When they did the temple, Solomon had a, a opening service that had the same sacrifices as the Day of Atonement. When we started in Leviticus, the opening sa- were set apart. That was a nine-day event, by the way. It has to do with the Pentecost because the Pentecost fire came out from heaven in every case uh, of when the inauguration was complete and the fire came down to say the heavenly sanctuary is open, 
How do we know it's the, saint, uh, the inauguration and not? Well, first of all, I said Christ entered the most holy place. Um, but let's go to verse 19. Therefore not, or verse 18, therefore not the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats and with wool, water, scarlet wool, hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. And it goes on there. How do we know this is not the Day of Atonement? Well, yes. And the other part is it was Moses. Moses was not part of the Day of Atonement. He was a part of the inauguration service. He went into the most holy place and anointed the most holy place, then the holy place, all the articles. Then he went out to the courtyard and all those articles. And then he put the blood on uh, Aaron and his son's thumbs, big toes, his, you know, all that. And they waited for nine days. But Moses never sacrificed on the Day of Atonement because Aaron was in charge from that point on. Okay? So this is the inauguration service. And yes... Moses went to the most holy place first because it wasn't open yet and he put the blood on all the articles to open up the service. That's part, when you go to the inauguration in Leviticus, you have the same thing. And then you have, of course, the story of Aaron's sons being killed shortly thereafter because they were drunk and they mixed the fire. Um, the sacred, instead of having the fire that God lit, they used the other. But that inauguration service is, how, is what we know is here because Moses did that, and from that point on, Moses wasn't sacrificing. Aaron was. Aaron was the high priest. So no, I didn't notice that for five, ten years. I mean, it took me a while. But those, when I call these useful irritants, they keep sithering, simmering in your head, and you sit there and you do your Bible study. Now, I always hang these things on this model, right? So even though I don't have necessarily, I'm studying everything through on a particular topic, I put it in this model. So if it's in the New Testament, I'm going uphill. If it's in the Old, I'm heading downhill. Yeah, I'm looking at the cross especially, what's going on there, what does it fix? And as it moves up, okay? So as we're as we're processing these things, this is what I call useful irritants because I have learned so much because of all the people who came to my churches and, and challenged me on something that I didn't know, but I'm not just going to ignore it. I'm going to find an answer for it. And so that, these are the, some of the answers that I found. And this is the methodology. This is the process. So William Miller's Bible study to me is very important if we're going to be safe in these last days. If you do systematic theology, the strength is you can tie all those texts together, but the weakness is people can mix them up in order and manipulate you. Okay? With exegetics, the strength is you're looking just at that text, saying what does this text mean to the people of that day and then to how we apply it to us. But the problem is sometimes it doesn't answer all the questions because we don't know where the comma goes if we, because there's two possibilities. And so we have... Every, everything we do has a weakness and everything has a strength. So we have to get the strength and weaknesses and be aware of it and then study. So when we study it from Genesis to Revelation, even if we don't use that in our Bible study with people, you don't have to do it in your Bible study, but for you to know that you're right on the topic, it's good for us to have gone through it this way. So let's take out our... Um, list of text and we'll go to another Genesis text Genesis 37 verse 35 now we're not going to get through all of these texts but they, I gave them to you in the order and I borrowed these from all sorts of Bible studies that Adventists did from Amazing Facts to the other, but I put them in the order of Genesis to Revelation. And I'll tell you, we didn't cover it all. Again, I did soul and souls, and there's like hundreds of texts of soul and souls alone. If you're going to look at all of those, um, it, it's critical that you do, but 
you're not going to get them in a study like this and get done. Okay, so Genesis 37, verse 35. Well, verse 34, that Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted, and he said, For I go down to the, to the grave for my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. So the term grave here is important when you start looking for it, because that's where we are when, we're, when we die. We're in the grave. It, just, it doesn't say in heaven. Um, but there's mourning, there's death, and this is where they thought Joseph had been killed. But let's take a look at um, the next Genesis text, 46, verse 26, then 27. This is one of those ones that I always try to get people to picture. Genesis 46, verse 26 and 27. And all the persons who went with Jacob to Egypt, who came from his body, besides Jacob's sons' wives, were 66 persons in all. And all the the sons of Joseph were born to him in Egypt were two persons. And all the persons of the house of Jacob who went to Egypt were 70. Now, in the King James, it's all souls. The souls went down to Egypt. So did they have disembodied spirits? Or were these people? So in this, in the New King James, they have them as people. But they aren't, so souls are based on the Genesis definition, and we are a soul. So these are his kids, grandkids, etc. That is what a soul is. Um, now, do you know that most of our doctrines are not about salvation, but about deception? about avoiding deception. It's about the fact that there is a a deceiver out there. And the state of the dead becomes very, very important because we're told that there are certain things that we're not to be doing. Leviticus 19, verse 31. Leviticus 19, verse 31. Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. A familiar spirit is, we would call it demon worship. It's a seance. Um, There are religious versions of this. When I was an intern in Chicago, a person came to um, Chicago who would cast out demons and our pastor t- told uh, our members not to go to the service because the Adventists were getting excited in the area. And um, one of the couples went that we, we had in our church. And they, they said that they would cast the demon out and then start talking with them. Folks, that's a familiar spirit. You can have a religious service. It says Jesus talked to Legion, but he didn't talk long. And he never told the disciples to talk to familiar spirits. If you cast out a demon, you cast them out. Okay? Um, And so my pastor got, senior pastor got a call from this couple saying all of a sudden they're having poltergeists and all sorts of things happening at their house. And he said, well, you need to get on your knees and repent and pray to God because he said, but pastor, you've got to come over and pray. He said, no, you went. I told you not to go. He said, no, you went. Now you need to get on your knees and repent. And when they did that and prayed to God and repented, then all the the spiritism stopped. But familiar spirits can be done under Christian guise if you're not careful. There are no spirits out there floating of relatives, etc. That's demonic. And God warns us against that in in Leviticus. So we're talking about not being deceived by spirits, not being deceived by these things. Um... Verse Leviticus 20, verse 27, just a little further. Um, well, verse 26 is that you should be holy to me, for I am the, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. 
a man or a woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones and their blood shall be upon them. Um, Spiritism's coming back big time, folks. You know that at college campuses, uh, paganism is coming back. They're, they're against Christianity and more and more college kids. And if you think science is immune to it, uh, the sci-fi channel has the most spiritualism programs on it because once you get away from God, your science just goes back to things. Even Star Trek, what I grew up with before I was an Adventist, went back to um, the gods of, of the P- Romans, the Roman gods. In many episodes, they had things involved with that. So science doesn't keep you from deception, folks. Uh, so this is why the Bible is very, very important. I'm going to skip the numbers. We want to get. I want to get to Job. Job. Chapter four, seventeen. Now, Job may be the oldest book of the Bible. It may have been written before Moses wrote the other books. Most people believe Moses wrote Job. Job 4.17. So even though it's a little later. Um, he has some great insights. Now, one of the things that I have to tell you is God will not talk to you about your problems, but he'll tell everybody else why things are going bad. We have all of Job's. You know everything that went on with Job, but Job's the one who doesn't, right? Did Job ever get told that he was being tested because the devil went to heaven? I said, I'm a better representative than anybody else on earth. And God says, I don't think so. I got Job. He goes, well, yeah, well, you're protecting him. And then the whole thing starts from there. Do you know the devil's gone in chapter 2? Never heard from again? God's still working with Job. But God never explains it to Job. And that's because every one of us has to deal with this by faith. And I believe one of the big tests for every human being is that we have something that we do not understand that God's doing and we have to trust God anyhow. Yeah. He did. But I don't know that he understood why the test was given, um, but that he still trusted God. Notice Job, uh, Job's wife was not the one God said, now this is a person who understands me. Um, And I'm not saying women are bad by this, just this in this one case, because women are mostly more faithful than men in this day and age. But she just said, you know, curse God and die. Get it over with, you know. Um, Maybe she understood more, but she's out of the the list very shortly after. But let's look at uh, Job chapter 4, 17. The wicked cease from troubling and they are weary at rest. Or in the King James said, Shall mortal men be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? So there are some differences in how the the versions are here. Oh, I'm in chapter 3. No wonder that's a little off. Sorry. Yep. But I was in chapter 3. I was reading it off the sheet. Um, can a man be more righteous than God? Can a, a man be more pure than his maker? I was in chapter 3, so it was a little off. Um, are we ever more pure than God? No. Do we have salvation based on our purity? No. 1 John 1, 8, 9 says... The first one says, he says he's without sin as a liar, basically. And the next one says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we're cleansed from all unrighteousness, now I almost got in trouble at camp meeting one year because somebody in the big tent said, is there anybody here who's perfect? And I started raising my hand. And my wife grabbed it. She was on my right side. I said, She says, I said, why? She says, you know what he means. I said, well, somebody's got to argue this occasionally. The Bible says that he has forgiven us and has cleansed us from all unrighteousness when we're confessing. Are we perfect? 
If you're cleansed from all unrighteousness, are you perfect? Do you still have sin in you? Just like verse 8 says, yes. But if we confess, it says, it doesn't say he cleanses us from a little of righteousness that that sin was. It says he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Someday I'm going to have some people who are going to be at camp meeting. Someone's going to say, is anybody here perfect? And there's going to be a whole bunch of hands going up because we believe the Bible more than our own experience. Okay? Does God mean it when he says he, that we have eternal life now? Yes. And that's in love, specifically. And that's learning to love our enemies. Yep. Job 14, verses 1 and 2. Job 14, verses 1 and 2. Man is born of woman is is of few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow, does not continue. And do you open your eyes on such a one and bring me to judgment with yourself? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. And then you find out what God can bring an unclean thing to cleanliness. Right? But it talks about how we fade away and how we're mortal. And one of the things, I don't know if you've ever heard of Edwin Fudge. He's a Baptist minister who uh, got tied in with Adventists for a little bit, but he wrote a, he was considered the most influential theologian of the 90s, and he wrote a book on the state of the dead. And it finally came together with him when he fi- figured out that the Bible does not teach an immortal soul came together with him because uh, he realized there were no texts about an immortal soul. Now he got into trouble in his early years. You know what his his troublemaking was for his uh, theology? Some Adventists get in trouble for this today and that is that you're not saved by your denomination. That you, you're, you're being a Baptist is not what gives you salvation. The church is not the one who provides salvation. This, the church is a, a portion of, a, of your relationship with God, but only Jesus saves. And that, that was some troubling things at, when I was at seminary when people were saying that being a Seventh-day Adventist is not what saves you. Well, who, what, what saves us? Jesus, a relationship with Jesus. Um, So just be aware as we go through that. So, Job 14, verses 10 to 12. But man dies and is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last. And where is he? As water disappears from the sea and a river becomes parched and dries up, so a man lies down and does not rise. Till heavens are no more, they will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. And then it goes, with, you would hide me in your, um, oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. And then verse 15, you shall call and I will answer. Job understood the resurrection. Job understood that. Do you know, um, do you remember the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. I was in a discussion online about that, and they were saying, why would God have Abraham sacrifice Isaac? And they were arguing, he was trying to get them to understand the horrors of child sacrifices from the neighborhood, etc. I I just wrote Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 Turn with me there. Verse 17 of Hebrews 11. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered his only begotten son, of whom it said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Now, I just want to pause there for a second. Isaac had no children. Isaac was the child of promise. The child of promise had to come through Isaac. Abraham was about to kill Isaac because God told him to. Why? And the issue is Abraham was elderly. 
very elderly. And what happens as you grow older? Some of us are younger at this. My dad died when I was age seven, and um, I was very much afraid of death until I became an Adventist. That was a lot of 13 years of processing. Then the Adventist thing, and not, I may be afraid of dying, but I'm not afraid of death. Do you understand the difference? I'm not looking for it if I have to die, but I'm not afraid of what happens. Well, Abraham was going through that, and it dawned on him. This is what, this is what Hebrews says. Well, the only way Isaac can be the child of promise and I can sacrifice him is if God can do what with Isaac? Raise him up. Listen to what it says. Concluding God was able to raise him up even from the dead, which he also received in a figurative sense. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. The whole story was there to teach Abraham about the resurrection. And, and ultimately that there would be a sacrifice on our behalf. The, goat, the sheep that was trapped, the ram that was trapped in the, in the thicket became the sacrifice. Did you have some? Yeah, and Canaanites were known for sacrificing the children, putting them through the fire, all those things, the firstborn. So, when we, when we talk about this, just remember, our ability, our ability to understand the resurrection, not just intellectually, but emotionally. We are intellectual and emotional beings. Um, by the way, do you understand why Adam was created first? And not Eve? Well, if you go back to Genesis 2, what did God do between the time Adam was created and Eve? He brought all the animals together and he brought them two by two. And he named them. And what did Adam notice? There was nobody like him. He didn't have anybody like him. All of them had two kinds. And he was all alone. And when he finally understood loneliness, intellectually and emotionally, God puts him to sleep, creates Eve, because he knows what is Adam going to be tested with. He's going to be tested with the issue of choosing of God when Eve sinned or eat the fruit and join her in sin. He had to choose between God and loneliness or Eve without God. Do you understand? So God is always putting us in the place where we're not, where we understand our temptation, our personal temptation, intellectually and emotionally. And that's why some of the things that happen with us, we, we don't r- really get it until we understand on the emotional level. Um, because we are very emotional beings. Job 10 to 12, uh, 14, 10 to 12, I think I just read. Job 14, 13 through 15, uh, I started reading. Oh, you could hide me in the grave that you could seal me until your wrath is passed. You would appoint me a, time, a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my service, I'll wait till my change comes. You will call, I will answer. You shall desire the works of your hands. God desires us. You know, he wants a relationship with us even every day he can get from us. It's a day lost when we, we die because of the things that we'll look at in a few th- uh, minutes. Job uh, seventeen thirteen. If I wait for the grave as my if I wait for the grave as my house, if I make my bed in the darkness, if I say to corruption, You are my father, and worm, you are my mother and sister, where is my hope? As for my hope, who can see it? Will it, will they go down to the gates of Sheol? Shall we uh, have rest together in the dust? And so we're arguing back and forth, and some of these are by the people that Job was arguing with and um, but the issue is what happens when you die? 
is there is there life after grave and and that's an important issue for us um i don't know if you remember the story of uh william uh cyrus barnsworth's son eugene eugene did not like preachers when he was young and he used to go out to the barn or somewhere else whenever the preacher came um the farns william farnsworth home was a little bit smaller than his brother Cyrus's home. And so one day he was out in the cornfield and Jan Andrews came. Jan Andrews just picked up a hoe and started hoeing. And Eugene said it was obvious he didn't know much about hoeing corn. The Farnsworth had been well known for their corn crops and potato crops and their wheat crops when they moved, a large group of them moved to Western Canada. They were very good at farming and after a little bit, they put the hose down, and um, Jan Andrews asked William uh, Eugene, he said, so Eugene, what, what are you going to be? He says, well, I've been thinking about stu- going to school and studying to be a lawyer. He says, well, you could do worse. He said, if he had confronted me in some way, I, I was ready for a fight. But instead, you know, he was just gentle and says, so what do you got to do? He says, well, I got to get some money for education, then I've got to go there. He said, and then what? Well, and then I'll go to school and study, and then, and then what? Well, I'll get a job and lawyer and get some money, start a family, and then what? Jan Andrews just kept asking. I've heard evangelists do this. I didn't realize it came all the way back from Jan Andrews. And then he's, and so he said, uh, I'll retire, he says, and then what? And by this time he was pretty frustrated. Well, I'll just get old and die. And Jan Andrews said, and then what? And he just looked, he said, he looked at me with those deep blue eyes, and he said, when you find the answer to that, the crossing that chasm, never let it go. And Eugene said, from that point on, he was faithful to Jan Andrews' appeal. And when he accepted Christ, he never let it go. Because that was getting across the chasm of death. So when we go back to these stories, I just want you to understand um, our, our ability to, to understand the Bible's teaching about this. Um, let's see. Job 27, verse 3. Oh, let's do 19. I don't want to skip this one. 19.25. Job 19.25-29. Did I get this right? Uh, no, I'm in verse 20. I got a chapter 20. Okay. Verse 19-25. to 25, All my close friends are whore me, and those whom I love turn against me. My bone clings to my skin and flesh, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. Have pity on me, have pity on me, O you, my friends, for the hand of God has struck me. Why do you persecute me and not satisfy with my flesh? Oh, that my words were written. Oh, they were inscribed in a book, that they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead and lead forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I will see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. For my heart yearns within me. If you should say, how shall we persecute him, since the root of the matter is found in me? Be afraid of the sword for yourself, for wrath brings punishment of the sword, that you may know there is judgment. Job, when it all comes down to, he says, I wish I could tell my story. I'm innocent. And his fr- these friends are arguing, he can't be innocent because look what God's done to you. That's punishment. I mean, he even had fire come down from heaven and fall on his animals. So we knew God was involved. And Job still says he's innocent, but he says, I know my Redeemer lives, and I will stand and see him. And so Job is one of my favorite about this whole state of the dead. Job 27, verse 3 now.
As long as my breath is in me and the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness nor my tongue utter deceit. As long as whose breath is in me? God's. God's spirit. The breath of life. Um, Psalms has some interesting things. We, I'm going to go through that. Um, verse Psalm 49, 15. We'll start there. Psalm 49, 15. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Um, there is a lot of psalms where David is being secured from enemies, and then he, but he also talks about being secured from the grave. Um, and so there are many of those here. Um, Psalm 115, 17, I'm just going to read this. It says, The dead praise not the Lord, neither are any that go down in silence. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 6, which comes after the Psalms, is one of our favorite ones about um, the state of the dead. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, 6, and then verse 10. For the living know they will die, but the dead know not anything. There is no reward, more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. All their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. That's 5 and 6, and then verse 10. Um, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Where is Solomon in his walk with God? He's not in a good place when he wrote Ecclesiastes. So is there any resurrection at this point? Nope. It's just live for tomorrow you die. Paul talks about that. Um, where eat, dr- people say eat, drink, be merry for tomorrow you die. And if that's all you got. But we've got a whole different future. Yep. Daniel chapter 2. Do you know Daniel chapter 2 is all about the state of the dead? You didn't notice that, did you? Remember the dream? Daniel 2. I'm not going to be able to read the whole chapter, so let's go through the dream. The head of gold is what kingdom? The silver is? The thighs? The legs of iron? The iron and toes of clay and iron? The breakup of Rome. Okay. The stone strikes the statue. When does the head disappear? Beetle Persia conquered, conquered uh, Babylon a long time ago, but where's the, is the head gone? No, it stays right there. And then the, the Beetle Persia, the body's still right there, even though the kingdom's gone. Then the bronze is still right there. When does everything break up? When the rock comes. And what do we know from Revelation? Now we're jumping ahead to the end of the book. There are how many resurrections in Revelation? Two. The first resurrection is the righteous. The wicked are destroyed that are alive and all the wicked who are dead are not resurrected. The righteous that are alive are changed, taken to heaven for a thousand years. Or 360,000 years. Depending if a day equals a year or if that's an epilogue. Remember, because a day equals a year, and it says a thousand years. So that'd be 360,000 years in heaven if it's that, but most scholars say it's an epilogue, so God took away the, the prophecy there. Okay, then what happens? So the kingdom of God comes, it's striking the earth, and then at the end of that thousand year period, the holy city descends, and the resurrection of the wicked occurs and who are from the wicked babylon medo persia greece rome breakup of rome all the people from all those generations and it's then that the actual statue gets destroyed and god's kingdom is set up forever so do you know that daniel 2 actually teaches the state of the dead because the head of babylon and greece medo persia all them They're still there until the stone strikes the earth 
because they're going to be alive at one day at the end of time until they get their final reward. By the way, how many sins did Jesus die for? The sins of all people. That's 1 John chapter 2, 1 to 3. Why is that important? Because nobody standing outside the New Jerusalem could not have been in it. There'll be nobody out there saying, but Jesus, I couldn't be in it because you didn't die for my sins. That's the, that's the saddest part about that whole thing, that strange act where God destroys the wicked, is that not a single wicked person had to be outside the city. That's right. And by the way, when do you start fixing your character before you come to Christ or after you come to Christ? After. That's an important concept. 1 John chapter 3 says we become sons and daughters. 1 John chapter 3, 1 to 3. And it says that he who has this hope of being a son and a daughter purifies himself. And by the way, you don't purify yourself. You work with God to purify because God writes the commandments in our hearts. God does all these different things. He, he tells us our job is confession and to believe in Jesus. Those are the two human works that I have found. So as we're, as we're going through this, isn't this kind of interesting? Prophecy upholds the state of the dead, even in this prophecy. Most of us don't look at that and say, oh, that's a state of the dead teaching. Because the gold stays right up there until the rock strikes the feet. And then it all crumbles. Huh. Daniel 12, verse 2. has a little statement. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So if you're a soul winner, you get to be a bright light. And by the way, as the darkness gets darker, even the dim lights look pretty good. Do you know uh, one of the most critical things in Vietnam or whether you lived or died was whether you smoked or not. Because the snipers could see the end of the cigarette for a long distance. And many a person died of cigarette from lead poisoning because they were lighting a cigarette up at night. Verse 12, at that uh, chapter 12, verse 1, at that time Michael shall stand up the great prince who stands watch over the sons of people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was a nation, even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who's found written in the book. And then verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Isn't that cool? Understand, we go to the grave, we're, we're unconscious, and um, we're, we're totally unaware of things. All right. Matthew 27. How many people are in heaven right now? I mean, people from the earth. Enoch, Elijah, Moses, and this group. Matthew 27, 52 and 53 tells us of this group. And I think this is kind of a cool... And behold, verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom of the earthquake... And the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of their grave after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Um, do you remember Peter's Pentecost sermon? Do you know what people did after the resurrection? They checked the cemetery out. Did you know that? Now think about it. These guys stayed in their cemetery plot, these, these caves, until Jesus came out of his cemetery plot. But they were already raised. And so there was a check on the graves. So what Peter preaches, we have David's bones to this day is still in the grave. We know David didn't make it in the resurrection. Because somebody checked out his cemetery plot. If I had a bunch of people coming into town who used to be dead 
and they came with Jesus walking through, I'd be checking out the cemetery, wouldn't you? So people were checking out the cemetery. That's why this whole resurrection thing took off. It's because it wasn't just Jesus who got raised. There are people who saw family members. And remember, Jesus taught it that death as a Christian is asleep. So when you look up death and talk about it, it's asleep. Now, we scare our kids sometimes with that. Now go to, I want to tell you, when you, you die, it's just like sleep. Now go to sleep. So we sometimes are scared kids with, with, with some of that. But the, the reality is that sleep is something you wake up from. So if you're going to be part of the second resurrection, or the first resurrection where you're going to have eternal life, your death is asleep because you're going to wake up. And it's, it's a permanent waking up. By the way, Romans 8, the last act of redemption, Romans 8. Verse 22, for we know the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, those who have been the Holy Spirit's been poured out on. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we are saved in this hope. So that redemption of our body is the last act of redemption. Okay? And so as, we, as you go through that, I just want you to understand that we're, we have resurrection power to live now. But one day we get our body, and then some of the things that we're tempted with will go away. But we'll get a body. Oh, by the way, um, how many of you, I'm going to be speaking on this when we have our work bee. The third weekend, uh, weekend from Friday through Tuesday, we're doing a work bee at the Sabbath trail. can use all the help we can get. Uh, we got a big chipper coming. We need people who can run chainsaws. We are going to chip the outer circle, which is way overgrown. Um, but I'm going to be speaking on prayer and I'm going to be using this next text that's in Romans 8. Uh, how many of you, what are the ans- three answers to prayer Adventists are most likely to talk about? Yes, no, wait, right? Those are the three answers to prayer. Well, if those are your only three answers to prayer, you haven't read Romans 8 very well. Because there's what I call, oh my answer to prayers okay and i got that from george takai sorry he always says and i just think this is appropriate go down just a little bit verse 25 but if we hope for verse 25 but if we hope for what we do not see we eagerly wait for it with perseverance verse 26 likewise the spirit also helps us in our weakness for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. But we know that all things work together for good for those who love God who are called according to his purpose. It does not say all things are good, right? It says all things work to good for those who love God. That means no matter what evil has come into your life from your sin or someone else's sin, It can work to good if you give it to God. But did you understand the prayer part here? Every prayer you pray is in the will of God. Not the way you prayed it. It doesn't say the way you prayed it puts it in the will of God. It says the Holy Spirit intercedes and he makes it in the will of God. So if you have the Holy... So if you're praying... If the Holy Spirit intercedes for that prayer and makes it completely in the will of God, it may not look like an answer to prayer that you're looking for, but if you're looking for answers to prayer that are better, then oh my. That's what I call the oh my answer to prayer. Okay? Now we had some of these when I was in Kansas. Our foster boy was in desert, was in the Gulf. He was driving a fuel truck through Fallujah at the height of the fighting. He was in the National Guard. And my wife says, what could we do to get him out of there? I mean, if he was in Kuwait, it would be fine. What could we do? Because a fuel truck is not something you want people shooting bullets at. 
Um, he's, you know, fueling tanks and all these other things. And so we just got to pray and, and ask God to do what he can do. I didn't have a good answer. Well, in Desert my, my foster son had a problem with his vision while he was driving trucks because in the United States he could wear contacts and the contacts he wore changed his astigmatism so he, he could see depth properly. But w over there they don't allow you because of the sand to wear contacts so he had to wear glasses so his distance stuff and his partner was afraid he was going to get killed because he was coming up too fast on trucks and other things. And so he was tested and they said you can't drive a truck anymore. So they made him a small arm, trained him in small arms repair. And he stayed the entire time on the base. Okay? Now, I could have told God what I wanted for his answer to prayer. All I said is I have no idea how to make this work. We just want him safe, etc. And by the way, he said he had a lot of fun because one of his favorite things is they, he had to fix the handheld rocket launcher that has a little tire thing on the back end that they would fire and when they went bad he had to you know fix it and then test it and he always got to fire a, a rocket whatever so what are the he was safe and we've had many prayers like that where, where we've said i don't have an answer for this what you want to do but lord i the, i'm claiming the holy spirit's power but if you're only looking for yes no or a lot of prayers yes no and wait a lot of prayers are going to sound a lot like no if you're not looking for the oh my right if you're not allowing the, yourself to see the holy spirit's intercessory prayer on your behalf that puts every prayer you pray in the will of god notice what it says here i used to say i don't know if i'm in the will of god or not and then i said this is okay god as long as the holy spirit's working with me it's in the will of god whatever the answer is now the problem is help me see it because it may not look like yes, no, or wait. And I'm finding that there are very few no's with God now that I'm looking. So if you come and you're on work be that weekend, this is the prayer, this will be the whole sermon that I'm doing is on this prayer for that work be. And we're to, we'll have some other devotional topics. But I just want you to know, isn't that exciting? We have a wonderful God who is preparing us to know exactly what he wants us to deal with. And the state of the dead, we understand it, so we don't have to be deceived, right? And all the things that happen in Revelation, the, the very last parts as we go through this, it just excites me because even if I die, I'm going to be okay. But I also believe that we may not have to die now everything says we're falling behind on the gospel message right population's growing faster we have more people who aren't believers we have the toughest secular group we have a lot of people who are um, basically Buddhist Buddhism is growing because Buddhism is your um, what's the exercise thing that you have in almost every community? Yoga is the entrance to Buddhism um, with its philosophy when you get up there. Stretching is fine. I don't see any problem with that. But the, the philosophy, if you have nothing for your philosophy, can easily take over. Well, God's at work in every community, right? Here's my rules from what I understand of the Bible. God knows how he's going to finish the work, correct? God says that we're supposed to be able to see his kingdom on earth. His kingdom. He has one. There are people in the kingdom who, aren't, who should be in our church that haven't been met yet. He's already designated who's going to be saved. He, he already knows. So let's start asking him, because he tells us in uh, John that he no longer calls us servants because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. He calls us friends. If you're going to be a friend of God, you have to know what your master's doing in your town. So the state of the dead is important for, deception, for the issues of deception in these last days. But the more important thing is our relationship with God, with prayer. Our relationship with God and seeing his kingdom here on earth. 
in your community. There are people who are key, who are going to bring in, you, you find the right person, there's going to be all these people following the train because of this, that power. God knows how he finishes this work. And my goal is to get us in tune with that. So when you study the Bible, one of my next studies I'm going to be doing is on this power of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit's supposed to do. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit's supposed to teach us all truth. And he's supposed to tell us the things that are to come. So there isn't anything we can't not know. And so as we close this session today, I don't want you to close. I want you to use this Bible study method on any topic you want to study because it will be how you can hear God speak and know and be confident that it's true. And that's where I'd like to leave. Can we pray together? Our Father, walking with you is the key. Hearing your voice tell us this house, this one I have someone in that I want you to have and meet. They are precious to me and they're going to be used in this last day. Just like Ananias talked with Paul, even though he questioned God, are you sure this is the one? Ultimately, Paul was exactly what God said. Father, open your, our hearts to the, your kingdom around us and help us to understand that the state of the dead is just one of the studies we need to do for this day. And help us to grow in your grace is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for inviting me. And... Uh, we do this all through the winters, um, and I'm going to be doing the Sabbath seminar. This one will be repeated. It's on your list. Um, but we're also doing the one on Sabbath and on salvation um, later on this at Washington. Uh, May 4th, I'll be at West Townsend Church. We'll be doing um, the Sabbath there. I'm practicing all of these. And then the week before April, I forget the last week in April, I'm doing Drewsville on Salvation and Savior. Um, so if anybody wants to join in, that's fine, but we're just following the same study method that we did here. You're welcome. Good.